When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Good evening, kitties. It is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, bringing you episode 36 of Twisted Tea Time. It has been a lengthy labor of love these past many months, and as season one draws to a close, I find myself reminiscing back to, oh, June 21st. Almost exactly 15 months ago, when I posted a video to YouTube telling the tale of the nightmare and the girl. Then my ambition was to jump headfirst into the YouTube horror community and, and proceed with my storytelling that way. But things didn't necessarily turn out that way, now did they? No, no. See, my YouTube channel aspirations were struck a catastrophic blow by those most sinister of things. An idea. A suggestion, really, by a friend that I make my storytelling more accessible by going full audio and running with a podcast rather than a YouTube channel. Well, who am I to turn down a good idea? It took until October to get my momentum on that front. My host body can be terribly lethargic, after all. But I, it finally did, and Twisted Tea Time was born. And despite a rocky start, it is still going almost a year later. Now, as I sit here in my cozy little den with my painfully alcohol-free tea... I find it is a time for such reminiscing, for looking back on the past with a fond eye, and forward to the future with an ambitious eye, while keeping an eye out for guests with my third eye, and for threats with the eye in the back of my head. It's really all quite deliciously freakish. But, <clears throat> I digress. I find myself grateful to all you listeners who have been keeping pace from the beginning. Or maybe you picked up the show after meeting me during one of my drunken ramblings in the Northwest. Or, or heard me through others' recommendations. Or merely stumbled across this little show in the aether of the Internet. Well, to all of you, I thank you. And with good fortune... There shall be many more episodes to come. Now, how to finish off such a year of fun and fear? Well, I believe you all know of my fondness for the works of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Not the man himself, he was quite a racist asshole. But his stories have had one hell of an impact on horror literature and movies even since they started getting published almost a hundred years ago. So I figure we'll start things off with something simple, something classic, and possibly the earliest surviving fictional work of the man. The final draft of this piece was written by H.P. Lovecraft when he wasn't quite yet a lad of 15. And I must say, it's far better than anything my host body writ wrote at that age. That's for damn sure. Though it did take years to actually get this story published. Well, without further ado, I present to you... The Beast, the beast. in the Cave. The cave. The Beast in the Cave by H.P. Lovecraft The horrible conclusion which had been gradually obtruding itself upon my confused and reluctant mind was now an awful certainty. I was lost, 
completely, hopelessly lost in the vast and labyrinthine recesses of the Mammoth Cave. Turn as I might in no direction could my straining vision seize on any object capable of serving as a guidepost to set me on the outward path. That never more should I behold the blessed light of day, or scan the pleasant hills and dales of the beautiful world outside, my reason could no longer entertain the slightest unbelief. Hope had departed, yet, indoctrinated as I was by a life of philosophical study, I derived no small measure of satisfaction from my unimpassioned demeanor. For although I had frequently read of the wild frenzies into which were thrown the victims of similar situations, I experienced none of these, but stood quiet as soon as I clearly realized the loss of my bearings. Nor did the thought that I had probably wandered beyond the utmost limits of an ordinary search cause me to abandon my composure even for a moment. If I must die, I reflected, then was this terrible yet majestic cavern as welcome a sepulchre as that which any churchyard might afford, a conception which carried with it more of tranquility than of despair. Starving would prove my ultimate fate. Of this I was certain. Some I knew had gone mad under circumstances such as these, but I felt that this end would not be mine. My disaster was the result of no fault save my own, since, unbeknown to the guide, I had separated myself from the regular party of sightseers, and, wandering for over an hour in forbidden avenues of the cave, had found myself unable to retrace the devious windings which I had pursued since forsaking my companions. Already my torch had begun to expire. Soon. I would be enveloped by the total and almost palpable blackness of the bowels of the earth. As I stood in the waning, unsteady light, I idly wondered over the exact circumstances of my coming end. I remembered the accounts which I had heard of the colony of consumptives who, taking their residence in this gigantic grotto to find health from the apparently salubrious air of the underground world with its steady uniform temperature, pure air and peaceful quiet, had found instead death in strange and ghastly form. I had seen the sad remains of their ill-made cottages as I had passed them by with the party and had wondered what unnatural influence a long sojourn in this immense and silent cavern would exert upon one as healthy and vigorous as I. Now, I grimly told myself, my opportunity for settling this point had arrived, provided that want of food should not bring me too speedy a departure from this life. As the last fitful rays of my torch faded into obscurity, I resolved to leave no stone unturned, no possible means of escape neglected. So summoning all the powers possessed by my lungs, I set up a series of loud shoutings in the vain hope of attracting the attention of the guide by my clamor. Yet as I called, I believed in my heart that my cries were to no purpose, and that my voice magnified and reflected by the numberless ramparts of the black maze about me, fell upon no ears save my own. All at once, however, my attention was fixed with a start as I fancied that I heard the sound of soft approaching steps on the rocky floor of the cavern. Was my deliverance about to be accomplished so soon? Had then all my horrible apprehensions been for naught? And was the guide, having marked my unwarranted absence from the party, following my course and seeking me out in this limestone labyrinth? Whilst these joyful queries arose in my brain, I was on the point of renewing my cries in order that my discovery might come the sooner, when in an instant my delight was turned to horror as I listened. From my ever-acute ear, now sharpened in even greater degree by the complete silence of the cave, 
bore to my benumbed understanding the unexpected and dreadful knowledge that these footfalls were not like those of any mortal man. In the unearthly stillness of this subterranean region, the tread of the booted guide would have sounded like a series of sharp, incisive blows. These impacts were soft and stealthy, as of the padded paws of some feline. Besides, at times when I listened carefully, I seemed to trace the falls of four instead of two feet. I was now convinced that I had, by my cries, aroused and attracted some wild beast, perhaps a mountain lion which had accidentally strayed within the cave. Perhaps, I considered, the Almighty had chosen for me a swifter and more merciful death than that of hunger. Yet the instinct of self-preservation never wholly dormant was stirred in my breast and though escape from the oncoming peril might but spare me for a sterner, more lingering end, I determined nevertheless to part with my life at as high a price as I could command. Strange as it may seem, my mind conceived of no intent on the part of the visitor save that of hostility. Accordingly, I became very quiet, in the hope that the unknown beast would, in the absence of a guiding sound, lose its direction, as had I, and thus pass me by. But this hope was not destined for realization, for the strange footfalls steadily advanced, the animal evidently having obtained my scent, which in an atmosphere so absolutely free from all distracting influences as is that of the cave, could doubtless be followed at great distance. Seeing, therefore, that I must be armed for defense against an uncanny and unseen attack in the dark, I groped about me the largest of the fragments of rock which were strewn upon all parts of the floor of the cavern in the vicinity, and, grasping one in each hand for immediate use, awaited with resignation the inevitable result. Meanwhile, the hideous pattering of the paws drew near, Certainly, the conduct of the creature was exceedingly strange. Most of the time, the tread seemed to be that of a quadruped, walking with a singular lack of unison betwixt hind and forefeet. Yet at brief and infrequent intervals, I fancied that but two feet were engaged in the process of locomotion. I wondered what species of animal was to confront me. It must, I thought be some unfortunate beast who had paid for its curiosity to investigate one of the entrances of the fearful grotto with a lifelong confinement in its interminable recesses. It doubtless obtained as food the eyeless fish, bats, and rats of the cave, as well as some of the ordinary fish that are wafted in at every freshet of Green River, which communicates in some occult manner with the waters of the cave. I occupied my terrible vigil with grotesque conjectures of what alterations cave life might have wrought in the physical structure of the beast, remembering the awful appearances ascribed by the local tradition to the consumptives who had died after long residence in the cavern. Then I remembered with a start that, even should I succeed in killing my antagonist, I should never behold its form as my torch had long since been extinct and I was entirely unprovided with matches. The tension on my brain now became frightful. My disordered fancy conjured up hideous and fearsome shapes from the sinister darkness that surrounded me, and that actually seemed to press upon my body. Nearer, nearer, the dreadful footfalls approached. It seemed that I must give vent to a piercing scream, Yet had I been sufficiently irresolute to attempt such a thing, my voice could scarce have responded. I was petrified, rooted to the spot. I doubted if my right arm would allow me to hurl its missile at the oncoming thing when the crucial moment should arrive. 
Now, the steady pat-pat of the steps was close at hand. Now, very close. I could hear the labored breathing of the animal, and terror-struck as I was, I realized that it must have come from a considerable distance and was correspondingly fatigued. Suddenly, the spell broke. My right hand, guided by my clever, trustworthy sense of hearing, threw with full force the sharp-angled bit of limestone which it contained toward that point in the darkness from which emanated the breathing and pattering. And, wonderful to relate, it nearly reached its goal, for I heard the thing jump, landing at a distance away where it seemed to pause. Having readjusted my aim... I discharged my second missile. This time, most effectively, with a flood of joy, I listened to the creature fell in what sounded like a complete collapse, and evidently remained prone and unmoving. Almost overpowered by the great relief which rushed over me, I reeled back against the wall. The breathing continued in heavy, gasping inhalations and expirations, whence I realized that I no more than wounded the creature, and now all desire to examine the thing ceased. At least something allied to groundless, superstitious fear had entered my brain, and I did not approach the body, nor did I continue to cast stones at it in order to complete the extinction of its life. Instead, I ran at full speed in what was, as nearly as I could estimate, in my frenzied condition, the direction from which I had come. Suddenly, I heard a sound, or rather a regular succession of sounds. In another instant, they had resolved themselves into a series of sharp metallic clicks. This time, there was no doubt, it was the guide. And then I shouted, yelled, screamed, even shrieked with joy as I beheld in the vaulted arches above the faint and glimmering effulgence which I knew to be the reflected light of an approaching torch. I ran to meet the flare, and before I could completely understand what had occurred, was lying upon the ground at the feet of the guide, embracing his boots, and gibbering despite my boasted reserve in a most meaningless and idiotic manner, pouring out my terrible story and at the same time overwhelming my auditor with protestations of gratitude. At length I awoke to something like my normal consciousness. The guide had noted my absence upon the arrival of the party at the entrance of the cave and had, from his own intuitive sense of direction, proceeded to make a thorough canvas of the by-passages just ahead of where he had last spoken to me, locating my whereabouts after a quest of about four hours. By the time he had related this to me, I, emboldened by his torch and his company, began to reflect upon the strange beast which I had wounded but a short distance back in the darkness, and suggested that we ascertain, by the rushlight's aid, what manner of creature was my victim. Accordingly, I retraced my steps, this time with a courage born of companionship to the scene of my terrible experience. Soon we descried a white object on the floor, an object whiter even than the gleaming limestone itself. Cautiously advancing, we gave vent to a simultaneous ejaculation of wonderment for of all the unnatural monsters either of us had in our lifetimes beheld, this was in surpassing degree the strangest. It appeared to be an anthropoid ape of large proportions, escaped perhaps from some itinerant menagerie. Its hair was snow white, a thing due no doubt to the bleaching action of a long existence within the inky confines of the cave but it was also surprisingly thin, being indeed largely absent save on the head, where it was of such length and abundance that it fell over the shoulders in considerable profusion. The face was turned away from us, as the creature lay almost directly upon it. The inclination of the limbs was very singular, 
explaining, however, the alteration in their use which I had before noted, whereby the beast used sometimes all four, and other occasions but two for its progress. From the tips of the fingers or toes, long nail-like claws extended. The hands or feet were not prehensile a fact that I ascribed to that long residence in the cave which, as I before mentioned, seemed evident from the all-pervading and almost unhealthy whiteness so characteristic of the whole anatomy. No tail seemed to be present. The respiration had grown very feeble, and the guide had drawn his pistol with the evident intent of dispatching the creature, when a sudden sound emitted by the latter caused the weapon to fall unused. The sound was of a nature difficult to describe. It was not like the normal note of any known species of simian, and I wondered if this unnatural quality were not the result of a long continued and complete silence, broken by the sensation produced by the advent of the light, a thing which the beast would not have seen since its first entrance into the cave. The sound, which I might feebly attempt to classify as a kind of deep-toned chattering, was faintly continued. All at once a fleeting spasm of energy seemed to pass through the frame of the beast. The paws went through a convulsive motion, and the limbs contracted. With a jerk, the white body rolled over so that its face was turned in our direction. For a moment I was so struck with horror at the eyes thus revealed that I noted nothing else. They were black, those eyes, deep, jetty black, in hideous contrast to the snow-white hair and flesh. Like those of other cave denizens, they were deeply sunken in their orbits and were entirely destitute of iris. As I looked more closely, I saw that they were set in a face less prognathous than that of the average ape, and infinitely more hairy. The nose was quite distinct. As we gazed upon the uncanny sight presented to our vision, the thick lips opened, and several sounds issued from them, after which the thing relaxed in death. The guide clutched my coat sleeve and trembled so violently that the light shook fitfully, casting weird moving shadows on the walls about us. I made no motion, but stood rigidly still, my horrified eyes fixed upon the floor ahead. Then fear left, and wonder, awe, compassion, and reverence succeeded in its place for the sounds uttered by the stricken figure that lay stretched out on the limestone had told us the awesome truth. The creature I had killed. The strange beast of the unfathomed cave was, or had at one time been, a man. Welcome back, kitties. Now, I don't know what your takeaway from all of this is, but I can't get over how impressive the protagonist's blind aim is. And his arm as well. Uh, sure, he missed with the first strike, but he managed to correct, throw his, his stone blindly with the second shot, and hit the thing hard enough that it was a killing blow. I mean, it took a while for it to die, sure, but it did die... Well, it was maimed, and then they put it out of its misery with a gun, but still, that's impressive. It's in the dark. And you know what? I've decided that in my head canon, the protagonist of this story and the guide, because we have to include a buddy, we have to include a partner, uh, the protagonist of this story and the guide uh, go on to form a mythos-themed baseball league. And they head it off with their team called uh, um, uh, the Cave Beasts. 
and future stories would involve their rise and fall as they compete against other teams like uh, the South Beach Shogoths or, or the Yellow Sign Yankees. Or Yankee Yellow Signs. Well, anyway, it would have everything. It would have, have drugs, uh, cults, uh, mafioso deep one gambling dens, and, and dealings with creatures from the outer dark to keep one's pitching arm strong. And all these things would be highlights of this sordid series of tales. Hmm. You know, that's not a bad idea. Someone better get on that. Well, you know what? Maybe I will. I need to consult someone about baseball, though. Don't really know too much about sports. Mm ah, uh, getting sidetracked here. <laughs> Moving on. Now, folks, I know I'm sort of beating a dead deep one here, but I must ask, if you like anything we do here at Twisted Tea Time... Take a minute or three out of your day to give us a rating on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, or, or even a review, or, or perhaps a like on SoundCloud, or a share on social media. Love the show and help us grow. That's kind of a cheesy slogan. I'll, I'll have to rethink that. Anyhow... Love em or hate em, iTunes is where podcasts rise and fall, and we've yet to hit the min minimum number of ratings for said ratings to show up when people glance at the show. Oh, sure, they can dig and find them, but it's the surface, the, the cover of the book that people look at, li like it or not. So any love or attention there would be much appreciated. Especially since I do so love attention. <laughs> oh, and if you're feeling particularly attentive, then go ahead and leave us a review as well. That would be positively perfect. On that note, I'd like to add that you shouldn't be shy, kitties. Feel free to talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud. Ask us questions if you like. Hell, I'll happily read reviews... Questions, even provide some answers, maybe, right here on the show. So there you go. Now, moving on once more. We continue this, the first of our season one closing episodes, with a very special story. See, I wanted to give this last year of podcasting a special send-off. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do until I realized why not do that most classic and recognized of Lovecraftian tales. Yes, my friends, I'm going to tell you about The Call of Cthulhu. It's a long one, though, so tonight I present to you with the first of three parts, The Horror in the Clay. The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft Of great powers or beings, there may be conceivably a survival. A survival of a hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested, perhaps in shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity. Forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods, monsters, mythological beings of all sorts and kinds. Algernon Blackwood One, The Horror in the Clay The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, 
each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle, wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by a bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden aeons which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of the truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things. In this case, an old newspaper item and the notes of a dead professor. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out. Certainly, if I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link in so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926 and 27 with the death of my granduncle, George Gamel Angel, Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages in Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. Professor Angel was widely known as an authority on ancient inscriptions, and had frequently been resorted to by the heads of prominent museums, so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat, falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled by a nautical-looking negro who had come from one of the queer dark courts of the precipitous hillside which formed a shortcut from the waterfront to the deceased's home in Williams Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded, after perplexed debate, that some obscure lesion of the heart induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man was responsible for the end. At the time, I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but latterly I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder, as my granduncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness, and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will be later published by the American Archaeological Society, but there was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling, and which I have felt much adverse from showing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor carried always in his pocket. Then indeed I succeeded in opening it, but when I did so, seemed only to be confronted by a greater and more closely locked barrier. For what could be the meaning of the queer clay bas-relief and the disjointed jottings, ramblings, and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle in his latter years become credulous of the most superficial impostures? I resolved to search out the eccentric sculptor responsible for this apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The bas-relief was a rough rectangle, less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing and writing of some kind the bulk of these designs seemed 
certainly to be. Though my memory, despite much familiarity with the papers and collections of my uncle, failed in any way to identify this particular species, or even to hint at its remotest affiliations. Above these apparent hieroglyphics was a figure of evidently pictorial intent, though its impressionistic execution forbade a very clear idea of its nature. It seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which only a deceased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole which made it most shockingly frightful. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. The writhing accompanying this oddity was, aside from a stack of press cuttings, in Professor Angel's most recent hand, and made no pretense to literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed Cthulhu Cult, in characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. The manuscript was divided into two sections, the first of which was headed 1925, Dream and Dream Work of H.A. Wilcox, 7 Thomas Street, Providence, Rhode Island, and the second, Narrative of Inspector John R. Legrasse, 121 Bienville Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, at 1908 AAS Meeting, Notes on Same, and Professor Webb's Account. The other manuscript papers were all brief notes, some of them accounts of the queer dreams of different persons, some of them citations from theosophical books and magazines, notably W. Scott Elliot's Atlantis and the Lost Lemuria, and the rest comments on long-surviving secret societies and hidden cults with references to passages in such mythological and anthropological source books as Fraser's Golden Bough and Miss Murray's Witch Cult in Western Europe. The cuttings largely alluded to outre mental illnesses and to outbreaks of group folly or mania in the spring of 1925. The first half of the principal manuscript told a very peculiar tale. It appears that on March 1st, 1925, a thin, dark young man of neurotic and excited aspect had called upon Professor Angel bearing the singular clay bas-relief, which was then exceedingly damp and fresh. His card bore the name of Henry Anthony Wilcox, and my uncle had recognized him as the youngest son of an excellent family, slightly known to him, who had latterly been studying sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design and living alone at the Fleur de Lis building near the institution. Wilcox was a precocious youth of known genius but great eccentricity and had from childhood excited attention through the strange stories and odd dreams he was in the habit of relating. He called himself psychically hypersensitive, but the state folk of the ancient commercial city dismissed him as merely queer, never mingling much with his own kind. He had dropped gradually from social visibility and was now known only to a small group of aesthetes from other towns, even the Providence Art Club, anxious to preserve its conservatism, had found him quite hopeless. On the occasion of the visit, ran the professor's manuscript, the sculptor abruptly asked for the benefit of his host's archaeological knowledge in identifying the hieroglyphics on the bas-relief. He spoke in a dreamy, stilted manner which suggested pose and alienated sympathy, and my uncle shewed some sharpness in replying, for the conspicuous freshness of the tablet implied kinship with anything but archaeology. Young Wilcox's rejoinder, which impressed my uncle enough to make him recall and record it verbatim, 
was of a fantastically poetic cast which must have typified the whole conversation, and which I have since found highly characteristic of him. He said, It is new indeed, for I made it last night in a dream of strange cities, and dreams are older than brooding Tyre, or the contemplative Sphinx, or garden-girdled Babylon. It was then that he began that rambling tale which suddenly played upon a sleeping memory and won the fevered interest of my uncle. There had been a slight earthquake tremor the night before, the most considerable felt in New England for some years, and Wilcox's imagination had been keenly affected. Upon retiring, he had had an unprecedented dream of great cyclopean cities of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths, all dripping with green ooze and sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics had covered the walls and pillars, and from some undetermined point below had come a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation which only fancy could transmute into sound but which he attempted to render by the almost unpronounceable jumble of letters, Cthulhu Fartagen. This verbal jumble was the key to the recollection which excited and disturbed Professor Angel. He questioned the sculptor with scientific minuteness and studied with almost frantic intensity the bas-relief on which the youth had found himself working. Chilled and clad only in his nightclothes when waking had stolen bewilderingly over him. My uncle blamed his old age, Wilcox afterwards said, for his slowness in recognizing both hieroglyphics and pictorial design. Many of his questions seemed highly out of place to his visitor, especially those which tried to connect the latter with strange cults or societies and Wilcox could not understand his repeated promises of silence which he was offered in exchange for an admission of membership in some widespread mystical or paganly religious body. When Professor Angel became convinced that the sculptor was indeed ignorant of any cult or system of cryptic lore, he besieged his visitor with demands for future reports of dreams. This bore regular fruit. For after the first interview, the manuscript records daily calls of the young man, during which he related startling fragments of nocturnal imagery whose burden was always some terrible cyclopean vista of dark and dripping stone, with a subterrene voice or intelligence shouting monotonously in enigmatical sense impacts, uninscribable save as gibberish, the two sounds frequently repeated are those rendered by the letters Cthulhu and Rilie. On March 23rd, the manuscript continued, Wilcox failed to appear, and inquiries at his quarters revealed that he had been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and taken to the home of his family in Waterman Street. He had cried out in the night, arousing several other artists in the building, and had manifested since then only alternations of unconsciousness and delirium. My uncle at once telephoned the family and from that time forward kept close watch of the case, calling often at the Thayer Street office of Dr. Toby, whom he learned to be in charge. The youth's febrile mind apparently was dwelling on strange things, and the doctor shuddered now and then as he spoke of them. They included not only a repetition of what he had formerly dreamed, but touched wildly on a gigantic thing, miles high, which walked or lumbered about. He at no time fully described this object, but occasional frantic words, as repeated by Dr. Toby, convinced the professor that it must be identical with the nameless monstrosity he had sought to depict in his dream sculpture. Reference to this object, the doctor added, was invariably a prelude to the young man's subsidence into lethargy. His temperature, oddly enough, was not greatly above normal, but his whole condition was otherwise such as to suggest true fever rather than mental disorder. 
On April 2nd, at about 3 p.m., every trace of Wilcox's malady suddenly ceased. He sat upright in bed, astonished to find himself at home, and completely ignorant of what had happened in dream or reality since the night of March 22nd. Pronounced well by his physician, he returned to his quarters in three days, but to Professor Angel he was of no further assistance. All traces of strange dreaming had vanished with his recovery, and my uncle kept no record of his night thoughts after a week of pointless and irrelevant accounts of thoroughly usual visions. Here the first part of the manuscript ended, but references to certain of the scattered notes gave me much material for thought. So much, in fact, that only the ingrained skepticism then forming my philosophy can account for my continued distrust of the artist. The notes in question were those descriptive of the dreams of various persons covering the same period as that in which young Wilcox had had his strange visitations. My uncle, it seems, had quickly instituted a prodigiously far-flung body of inquiries amongst nearly all the friends whom he could question without impertinence, asking for nightly reports of their dreams and the dates of any notable visions for some time past. The reception of his request seems to have been varied, but he must at the very least have received more responses than any ordinary man could have handled without a secretary. This original correspondence was not preserved, but his notes formed a thoroughly and really significant digest. Average people in society and business, New England's traditional salt of the earth, gave an almost completely negative result. Though scattered cases of uneasy but formless nocturnal impressions appear here and there, always between March 23rd and April 2nd, the period of young Wilcox's delirium. Scientific men were little more affected, though four cases of vague description suggest fugitive glimpses of strange landscapes, and in one case there is mentioned a dread of something abnormal. It was from the artists and poets that the pertinent answers came, and I know that panic would have broken loose had they been able to compare notes. As it was, lacking their original letters, I half suspected the compiler of having asked leading questions, or of having edited the correspondence in corroboration of what he had latently resolved to see. That is why I continued to feel that Wilcox somehow cognizant of the old data which my uncle had possessed, had been imposing on the veteran scientist. These responses from Aesthetes told a disturbing tale. From February 28th to April 2nd, a large portion of them had dreamed very bizarre things, the intensity of the dreams being immeasurably the stronger during the period of the sculptor's delirium. Over a fourth of those who reported anything reported scenes and half-sounds not unlike those which Wilcox had described, and some of the dreamers confessed acute fear of the gigantic nameless thing visible toward the last. One case, which the note describes with emphasis, was very sad. The subject, a widely known architect with leanings towards theosophy and occultism, went violently insane on the date of young Wilcox's seizure, and expired several months later after incessant screamings to be saved from some escaped denizen of hell. Had my uncle referred to these cases by name instead of merely by number, I should have attempted some corroboration and personal investigation. But as it was, I succeeded in tracing down only a few. All of these, however bore out the notes in full. I have often wondered if all the objects of the professor's questioning felt as puzzled as did this fraction. It is well that no explanation shall ever reach them. The press cuttings, as I have intimated, touched on cases of panic, mania, and eccentricity during the given period. 
Professor Angel must have employed a cutting bureau, for the number of extracts was tremendous, and the sources scattered throughout the globe. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London, where a lone sleeper had leaped from a window after a shocking cry. Here, likewise, a rambling letter to the editor of a paper in South America, where a fanatic deduces a dire future from visions he has seen. A dispatch from California describes a theosophist colony as donning white robes and masks for some glorious fulfillment which never arrives, whilst items from India speak guardedly of serious natives' unrest toward the end of March. Voodoo orgies multiply in Haiti, and Africa outposts report ominous mutterings. American officers in the Philippines find certain tribes bothersome about this time, and New York policemen are mobbed by hysterical Levantines on the night of March 22nd and 23rd. The west of Ireland, too, is full of wild rumor and legendry, and a fantastic painter named Ardois Buno hangs a blasphemous dream landscape in the Paris Spring Salon of 1926. And so numerous are the recorded troubles in insane asylums that only a miracle can have stopped the medical fraternity from noting strange parallelisms and drawing mystified conclusions. A weird bunch of cuttings, all told, and I can at this date scarcely envisage the callous rationalism with which I set them aside. But I was then convinced that young Wilcox had known of the older matters mentioned by the professor. Welcome back, kitties. Well, who ever thought that the blessing of the unimaginative would be to remain safe and comfy in bed while Cthulhu's dreams drive all the artists and poets and other creatives mad? Win one for the salt of the earth, eh? Hmm. Well, so ends the first part of Call of Cthulhu. Be sure to join us in our next episode for the continuation of this classic tale. Oh, do you hear that? Ah, yes. I do believe I know what that music means. Ha <laughs> ha, yes. It means it is time for the podcast shout out. This episode's podcast shout out goes to The Dark Toe. Imagine, if you will, my kitties, a book that holds literal doorways to other worlds, making it capable of transporting you into the stories within its very pages. Well, Cassie, a wayward teenage girl, has come across one such book, The Dark Tome. But I think I'll let her tell you all about it. I wouldn't exactly call my life normal, but things have gotten a little weird since I started experimenting with this book called The Dark Tome. When I say the book opened other worlds, I mean that literally. It it worked! It worked! Holy crap, it worked! There it is. The little village. Uh, what did they call it? Uh, Posse... Posse, uh... Positano. Ah! No need to be frightened, little girl. If you think imagination is a toy to be locked in a box when the grown-up world comes crashing in, then you must never have heard the legend of the Dark Tome. I mean, I never had either. Not until that May. It was 820 steps from Suliscale to the world below. I walked them again and again with my father, following his tread from our home in the sky and then back again. I walked those stairs when I slept in my dreams. If I had any sense, I would stay home now, but I can't. I don't want to. I need another story. 
The truth? I believe the stairs led down into hell. And hell was where I wanted to go. The Dark Tome is a weird fiction podcast series by Fred Greenhalgh and Bill DeFries. Find The Dark Tome on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts by searching The Dark Tome, or go to thedarktome.com. The Dark Tome. Open the book. Unlock imagination. What happens now? Will you continue reading, or... I don't know. It is up to you. I have all the time in the world. Now, the Dark Tome has an interesting layout. You follow the adventures of Cassie and Mr. Gussie as they explore the stories of the Dark Tome in chapters that are usually broken down into two parts. Then, between their adventures, the creators treat you with a standalone horror or weird fiction audio drama before bringing you back to our intrepid book-hopping duo. All of which feature excellent production values, writing, and voice acting. You can find The Dark Tome on iTunes and Stitcher Radio or wherever you get your podcast fix. As well as thedarktome.com Now, alas, my friends, how time does fly. I am afraid I must say goodbye. I know, I know, the story is not quite done. But return next time for more scares and fun. <laughs> Good night, kitties, and pleasant dreams. The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or the simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade, and you can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com on Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for this episode of Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com, as well as Jason White at www.soundcloud.com forward slash angels dash of dash despair. This episode's podcast shout out was The Dark Tome, which can be found at www.thedarktome.com. If you want to support the show and help us grow, then leave us a review or rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or go to patreon.com forward slash the Mad Catter to sign up for some low cost monthly subscription and get bonus goodies. And we all know how much you love goodies. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. And you can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Cheshire Hat. So good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams.